starting a, a new series uh, called Building Blocks, and this is a series about vision, and we are excited today to talk about our vision. Before I get started, I want to say something about Jen, uh, Wayne and Jennifer McMasters. This is their last Sunday here. They're moving to the Philippines, and uh, just give these guys a hand. We love you guys, so love you very much. Appreciate you. So here we are. We're in a series called Building Blocks of Bayshore, and uh, we want to talk a little bit about our vision today and what the vision is for our church. So this is an important uh, vi- uh, series for you. If you're first time here today, great time to join us. If you've been coming for 30 years, this is a great time to come because we're going to be focusing on what our vision is. It's important for us to understand that if we're going to be successful as a church uh, and as a, a ministry, it's important for us to understand what our mission is. What is our mission? What is our objective? What's the main thing that we're trying to accomplish? Zig Ziglar said years ago, if you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time. So we want to talk about what are we aiming for? What is our focus? Uh, Stephen Covey said, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And I really believe that because if we are able to understand what the main thing is at Bayshore, then it's going to help us to understand our part in that process and how that fits for us and how it works for us. And uh, so we want to talk a little bit about that. You know, sometimes, you know, churches uh, just sort of like kind of make it up as they go along, trying to figure out, you know, what they're doing and not really understand what the objective is. I heard years ago about this, uh, this guy that was from New York City. He was in the Smoky Mountains. He was hiking in the Smokies and he's up there and he comes across this this cabin uh, in the woods and there's this kind of like Tennessee kind of hillbilly sitting on the porch and he's sitting there and he's uh you know kind of rocking in his chair and he's chewing his red man and uh, he's just hanging out there and around the cabin uh, there were these trees that had uh, targets painted on them and in every target right in the bullseye was a bullet and this old, this old guy from New York, he looked at that. He thought, my, that's amazing. And he said to the guy on the porch, the hillbilly, you know, uh, chewing the red man tobacco, he said, uh, you know, how did you get to be such a good marksman? He said, well, it's pretty easy. What I did is I shot the tree and then I drew the target around the bullet. <laughs> and I think a lot of times that's what organizations are doing. That's what churches are doing. They don't really know what their objective is, and so they're kind of like making it up as they go along. So we want to be a little different than that. We want to be a church that understands what our main uh, mission is. Here's here's something I want you to think about. Uh, Great churches have this in common. Everyone understands the vision and is excited about the vision. Great churches have this in common. Uh, Everyone understands the vision and is excited about the vision. So we want to make sure that you understand what the vision is of Bayshore, that you have a clear understanding of what the vision is. And not only do we want you to understand it, uh, the goal of this series is not only for you to understand the vision, but to be able to communicate that vision of Bayshore to someone else. So if someone came up to you and they said to you, they said, uh, hey, what is the vision of your church? Uh, If your neighbor came up to you and said, what is your church about? Could you articulate what that vision is? And so we want to make sure, we want to equip everybody uh, in our church with the the tools and the understanding so that they can, uh, so that you can communicate what the vision is. So everybody at Fenwick Island understands what the vision is because the vision that we have at Fenwick Island, the vision we have here at Millsboro, the vision we have at Rehoboth is all the same vision. And we want to talk a little bit about what is that vision. So what is the first building block? Uh, One of the things I would say about the building blocks is when you understand the vision, uh, when you understand the vision, it creates energy and excitement. Uh, Here's what the book of Habakkuk says, Habakkuk 2.2 says, Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. Uh, write down the revelation, or we could say write down the vision and make it plain on tablets though a herald may run with it. So here's the thing, when you understand the vision and it's clear to you, it creates excitement and energy. If you go to a church or if you go to any organization and the morale is low, the energy is low, 
it's oftentimes because people don't understand what the mission is or what the vision is. So we want to have a church of high energy, a church of high excitement, and that's going to happen when we understand the vision. Here's something that you can uh, put in your kind of write down here. Clarity produces energy and in movement. Lack of clarity produces stagnation and lethargy. Clarity produces energy and movement. Lack of energy produces stagnation and lethargy. So that's when it says in Habakkuk, if you write down the vision of the revelation and you make it plain, then the herald can run with it. He has the ability to be excited and move with it. So here's the deal. Let's talk about what is some of the fundamental things of uh, Bashor. Here's, here's the first building block of Bashor. And this is true for the Femic Island campus, true for the Rehoboth campus, it's true for this campus. The, uh, the fundamental, one of the fundamental building blocks of Bashor is that we are a church that believes we're to call to reach our community, to reach people that don't go to church. And so we want to be a group of people, not only that come to church, that enjoy church, enjoy the music, enjoy the skits, enjoy the video, enjoy the teaching. We don't want simply to be a church that just enjoys that ourselves, but we want to be a church that engages in inviting other people inviting our neighbors, inviting our friends, inviting people that aren't normally going to church. And so we're a church not simply for church people, but we're a church for people that don't go to church anymore. We're a church for people that used to go to church and don't go to church anymore. We're a a church for people that, you know, they grew up in church and they quit going to church because when they went to church as a kid, it was awful. So we want to be a church that recaptures those kind of people. And, and we want to reach out to people that, you know, maybe are Christians, but they're no longer going to church. They've sort of fallen by the wayside, and they're not really walking with the Lord. One of the things I, I often think about, I think about people that, you know, that, that had a, a, a faith in Jesus and put their faith in Jesus and, and loved Jesus and made a commitment to the Lord, but then they just kind of fall away from church. One of the questions that I'm often tempted to ask, and this is a question that I know would be offensive to some people, is the question is, 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 I know you made a commitment to the Lord, you prayed a prayer sometime, but are you now walking with the Lord? Are you walking with the Lord? And uh, that's a question that I think is important to, to ask. And so we want to be a church that we are inviting people that don't come to church, People that are away from church, that's an important thing. And I believe, and I'm passionate, and I love the local church. I love it. I believe in it. I believe what we're doing. I love the local church. Uh, Someone said years ago that the local church is the hope of the world. The local church is the hope of the world. Now, Andy Stanley said a little different. He said that Jesus is the hope of the world, and the local church is the vehicle to communicate that hope to people. And I believe it's important. So here, let's just, let's just get down to the, uh, the brass knuckles right now. How many people come to church? How many people in America come to church? We're, as we look at the post-COVID world that we live in, how many people are coming to church? That's an important thing. Uh, I want to understand that. So there was this study done uh, that was released June 21st, not too long ago, 2022, by a Statista Research Department. And uh, this is an interesting thing. And here's what it says. In America, 22% of people in America go to church every week. 22% of people in America come to church every week. Now, I just have to tell you, there's some of you that are in that category. And uh, as a pastor, uh, I just have to tell you, I really, really, really appreciate people like that. There's people that if they don't walk across the parking lot on Sunday morning, I know something bad has happened in their family because they're always here. And uh, every pastor and every leader, uh, Pastor Chase in the uh, Fenwick Island campus, Pastor Joel at the Rehoboth campus, we all have people that are in that 22% that they just like, they go to church every Sunday, and it's a habit for them. Now, is it bad to have a habit of going to church every Sunday? Is it bad for church to be a habit? I don't think so. 
The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse uh, 24 and 25, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some are in the habit of doing. So you can get in a habit of not going to church regularly, or you can be a person that comes to church every week. And I love that. I love people that, uh, I love everybody, but it's just very, very special to have people that are, are like that. They're very, very consistent. 22% uh, people in America go to church every week, and that's really, really interesting, really interesting, 22%. 9% come almost every week. 9% come almost every, uh, almost every week. That's 31%. You put all that together. 9% come almost every week. I don't know what that means exactly, almost every week. I think that means like you miss every once in a while, but you're like pretty much there all the time. 9% come uh, almost every Every week. Now listen to this. Here's interesting. 11% of Americans come about once a month to church. 11% of Americans come about once a month to church. Now that's interesting. So that's about, you know, some people that have that pattern, they come about once a month. And I'm very grateful for that. People that are, have that spiritual hunger and they, they come to church and their lives are busy and crazy and all that. Some watch online and live, but about, not, about uh, 11% come about once a month. Now here's, here's an interesting one. These are the, the bottom two are what we're really interested in today. 25% of people seldom come to church in America. 25%. So uh, that's, that's uh, you know, 25 out of 100. 25% uh, seldom come to church. Now, what does that mean, seldom? That probably means that they come to church on Christmas and on Easter, they're the, the C&E Christians, and they come to church on Christmas and Easter. And I just love uh, Christmas and Easter. I just love all the people that are here. I love Christmas Eve. It's one of my favorite services. But 25% of people come seldom. And here's an interesting one. 31% never come. 31% of Americans never go to church. So that means that in, our, in, a, in the food line grocery store, when you're looking around in food line and you're doing your groceries, 31% of the people that you uh, meet in food line don't come to church ever. They never go to church. If you were to add up 25, the seldom, that's the people that come on Christmas and Easter, uh, and you add up with the nevers, then you end up with about 56% of people never Never or maybe just Christmas and Easter come to church. So that's interesting, 56%. How many know that's a lot of people? That's half of the people in your neighborhood. That's half of the people that you work with. That's half of the people that we encounter uh, never come to church. So uh, the question is, it has to be asked of, of our church, is who is our church for? Who is our church for? Is our church for us? Or is our church for them? Is our church for us or is our church for them? That's an important question. Every church has to ask that question. Now, I happen to believe that the answer to that is a both and. I believe that our church is for you that want to grow in your faith because when you come on Sunday mornings, um, we're not going to just simply deal with the light stuff. We're going to preach through the Bible. We're going to deal with tough stuff, and we're going to talk about it in a way that's relevant so people can understand it and to make sense to them. But our church simply is not just simply about us, but our church is about them. So I want you to say this really uh, important thing for us. Everybody at Femic Island, everybody here, I want you to say, our church isn't just for us. It's for them too. So... The question has to be, is what is our role in reaching the 56% of people that don't come to church? What is our role? And uh, I think as we see things change in our society, we think, see things change in America, it becomes very important that we play a role in reaching those people that are, are outside of the faith. So here's the deal. Um, is it, does it help people? to come to church. Does it help people to come to church? Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, it really helps people to come to church in a practical way. Practical way. There was a study done by Vanderbilt University not too long ago by a guy named, uh, he's a PhD, he studies uh, research for men's health. Uh, Marino Bruce, Vanderbilt University, interviewed 5,000 people, did this study, and here's what they discovered. People that come to church 
Live longer. People that come to church live longer. How many are all about living longer? Now, that's a little weak. I wonder if some of you are like wanting to check up. How many want to live longer? Just say, yeah, I want to live longer. Everybody at Family Godly, how many want to live longer? I'm for that. I want to live longer. I want to go see Jesus, but I don't want, I don't want to be on the next load. You know what I mean? I want to be, I want to live longer. Here's the deal. Here's what he says. People that uh, go to church regularly reduce their mortality risk by 55%. They reduce their mortality uh, risk by 55%, and uh, it's between, uh, that's particularly important to the ages 40 to 65. So if you're 40 to 65 and you come regularly to church, statistical studies say that you're going to live longer than people that don't go to church regularly. So... You know, that's a good thing. It's good for you. Coming to church, being in a spiritual community is good for you. The American Medical, the American Medical Association says those who attend church services more often actually have a better chance of staying alive in the long run. That was in the Washington Post. Uh, and uh, here's uh, Mar- uh, this uh, Marina Bruce at Vanderbilt University says, again, for those who do not attend church, they are twice as likely to die prematurely from those who do attend church regularly. So not coming to church is suicidal. <laughs> so there's something about being in a spiritual community that makes us better. Now, here's the th- thing about this Vanderbilt study. The Vanderbilt study says that, you know, it's not just the social interaction with people that make you live longer. Uh, In fact, they studied, okay, if I go to a book club and I have social interaction, because you may be thinking, well, you know, it's going to make people healthier if they're networked with people, which is true. Hanging out with people is part of how we do better when we're living, you know, uh, we're healthier when we're connected socially. But they found out that there was something unique about going to church, going to a spiritual community where there's worship, where there's people that love you, where there's teaching about how to live your life in a better way. Uh, The people that are a part of that have greater longevity, very important thing there. So that's important. Harvard, Harvard did a study as well, 20-year study from Harvard, particularly focused on women that uh, they studied 75,000 women uh, between the ages of 46 and and 71, and they found that it reduced mortality in women, that women that come to church live longer. So just say this with me. I want to live longer, so I'm going to come to church. If you don't get your neighbors to church, you're going to kill them. (laughs) They They need to be here. They need to be a part of what, of what we're doing and all of that. So that's the thing. You'll live longer. How about this one? Well, you'll be less depressed. Studies uh, confirm this. Uh, Tyler Vander Weel uh, from Harvard uh, says that uh, women, he did a study on women, and they are uh, were less, less likely to be depressed if they come to church. So we know that it affects uh, the moods of people, that people have greater uh, positive feelings when they go to church. They handle stress better. I don't know if you know this, but there's a, you know, probably you know a little bit about biology that, you know, on, on top of your kidneys, there's, a, there's a, a hormone that's released called cortisol. And cortisol is, is, it helps you when you're dealing with stress. So if you have, you know, stress or whatever, dogs chasing you, cortisol is released to give you energy. And so that's important. Cortisol in your body is a good thing. But too much cortisol, if you're stressed out all the time, and you're stressed and you're worried about everything and you're watching the news and you're freaking out and you're looking at the, uh, the, the, how much the, uh, the gas prices are and all that and, and you're under stress and your body releases too much cortisol, it affects your body in a negative way. It affects your immune system and it also affects your heart. Now, here's what's really interesting. You won't believe this. But they've done studies to show, uh, this neuroscientist by the name of Andrew Newberg did studies uh, on the cortisol release of people that come to church regularly. And the cortisol release of people that come to church is lower than the people that don't go to church. So that means that, that as you come to spiritual community, 
it's helping you deal with your stress better. So that's, that's a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, and so that's really good. And so there's, that's another thing. Uh, here's another one, and maybe you've heard this one before. If you come to church regularly, and this is why we're trying to reach our community and make our community healthier, to make our community better. If you come to church regularly, your marriage is going to do better. Your marriage is going to do better. Studies are very firm about this. That couples that go to church together, and I saw, I just loved it today, watching some of you guys come to church together, the couples, and we got some newlyweds over here, and they came in, and I married them about a month ago, and they're still happy and loving each other, you know, and that kind of thing. They had a fight at the airport, they said, but we all have fights at the airport. How many know that? How many have ever had a fight at the airport? I mean, good night. You know, we travel, Karen and I get along great, but when we travel, I mean, we, we're attacked by demons when we travel. Does that happen to you? But couples come into church and holding hands, that's a good thing. That helps people. Uh, and you say, well, did Pastor Danny, you're just saying that? Well, no, there's studies. Tyler Vanderweel again, the guy from Harvard. Couples who attend religious services are 47% less likely. 47%, that's almost 50%, less likely to subsequently divorce than other couples. That's a good thing. That's a good thing for your marriage. Karen and I, we go to church every Sunday. <laughs> we never miss except on vacation. We just, we just, we don't, we just, we come to church every thing. And we've been married for 45 years this week. And I tell you, she's just amazing. I just married way over my head. You know, she's incredible. But uh, studies show that couples that come to church are 40% yet less likely to, to, to get divorced. Now, I read this. I started reading this book this week. Actually, Pastor Chase told me about this book called Love Thy Body, uh, Answering Hard Questions About Life and Sexuality uh, by Nancy Piercy. Nancy Piercy said this. She said, among adults who identify as Christians but rarely attend church, 60% have been divorced. Couples that identify say, I'm a Christian, and there's a lot of people in our community that say, and that's part of the people we're trying to reach and get back in church. The people that say, I'm a Christian, but they rarely go to church. She said in her study, among adults who identify as Christians but rarely attend church, 60% have been divorced. Of those who attend church regularly, the number is 38%. That's a big drop. So the percentages go way up for our marriages when we go to church regularly. And that's why it's important, very important for all of us. And um, how many have ever, hey, let me just, hey, we're just out here, we're just folks, right? How many have ever had some stress in your marriage, you know? I mean, just raise your, maybe, no, maybe, you know, you, you could raise your hand. How many have had some stress on your marriage? I mean, we've all had some stress in our marriage. Somebody said once there's the, uh, you know, there's the engagement ring, there's the wedding ring, and then there's suffering. You know, we've been through all that. But your marriage, you know, I, I looked at all these couples we had at VBS this week. I mean, particularly Thursday night when we had the big water slides here. And I mean, we got, man, we got some young couples in our campuses. I mean, really, you know, they got little kids running around. Those parents got bags under their eyes, you know, and the kids are just beating their brains out. You know what I mean? We've been there. And the kids are running around. Those, those couples love VBS. They love VBS. You know why they love VBS? Because they dropped their kids off and they got a couple hours free. And we want to help these couples in our community. Family College campus has got so many young couples. Our Rehoboth campus, we got young couples here. How many here this morning are you're under, you're 40 or under, 40 or under, raise your hands, 40 or under here, and we got a lot of 40 or unders here. Let's give our, our 40 or unders a big hand. You're in the midst of it. You're raising kids, you know, they got soccer practice, they got basket weaving, you know, class, they got everything. You're running yourself to death. We kept our kids the other night, our grandkids the other night, all four of them, all four of them. I, I was in bed for two days after they left, you know. <laughs> You know, the guy that said, I've seen the lights of Paris, I've seen the lights of Rome, but there's nothing like the taillights of the car of my kids taking my grandkids home, you know? <laughs> but it's tough. It'll help your marriage. Among adults who identify as Christians but rarely attend church, 
60% have been divorced. Of those who attend church regularly, the number is 38%. Church attendance uh, helps you in, in a lot of ways. And here's some obvious ones. The, neurosolog- uh, no, the neuroscientist, Andrew Newberg, the guy that did the cortisol study, he said church attenders commit suicide less often, deal with pain better, have less cardiovascular problems, and recover from surgery quicker. So that's all good because I've talked to about 50 people today who's getting knee replacements. So we have a lot of that going on. And so coming to church is going to help you get healed up better. Say this way, coming to church is not a burden. It's a blessing. Coming to church is not a burden. It's a blessing. So we want to be asking people to come to church. We want to be inviting people. There's a classic example in the Bible of someone that invited someone to come to church. And it's found in the 10th chapter of Acts, and it's a guy by the name of Cornelius. He was a centurion, which means he oversaw 100 soldiers in a, in a, in a group of uh, 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 soldiers. 600, the soldiers were, uh, were divided into s- groups of 600 and then into groups of 100. He was over 100 soldiers. He lived in this place called Caesarea. He was a God-fearer. He went to synagogue. He was a Gentile. And uh, he had a, a vision one day. And the vision was from an angel. This guy was praying. He was a Gentile, probably hadn't been circumcised, but he believed in the God of Israel. And he, he'd given up on the Roman gods. And so one day he's praying at 3 in the afternoon, which the Jews always did. And he's not a Jew, but he's a Gentile. He's praying at 3 in the afternoon. He's praying. And he has a vision. And the angel says to him, why don't you go, uh, we want you to go and ask, send some people and, and ask for a man by the name of Simon Peter who's staying in Joppa and have him come and talk to you. And he's going to send for Simon. Simon's going to preach the gospel. Big question right here. Why didn't the angel just tell him about Jesus? Why didn't the angel just tell uh, uh, Cornelius about Jesus? He came from heaven where Jesus is seated in the right home. Why didn't he just tell Cornelius about Jesus? Because angels are not the agents of salvation. You and I have been called by God to network people into the kingdom of God. You have been handed the baton by Jesus. I have been handed the baton by Jesus to tell people about the gospel. And so, anyhow, Cornelius sends his two servants, sends one of his soldiers, a devout soldier, and they ask for Peter. Peter's had his own vision. God's preparing him to preach to the Gentiles. But when Peter comes, it takes him two days to come from Joppa to Caesarea, where Cornelius is. And when he gets there, verse 24 of Acts 10 says this. The following day, he arrived at Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. He would called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up, stand up. He said, I'm only a man myself. Verse 27, while talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. So how did those people get there, and why did they come? They came because Cornelius invited them to come to hear Peter. Now, they didn't know Peter. They didn't know anything about Peter. Peter wasn't famous. I went to, uh, uh, to the Freeman stage on Friday night to hear uh, Nate Bargatze, one of my favorite comedians, and it was thousands of people there. It was wonderful, and we were all there because we knew Nate Bargatze. But they didn't know Peter from anybody. The only reason they came was because Cornelius, whom they respected, they knew Cornelius, they knew him, and so Cornelius invited them. And because Cornelius invited his relatives and his close friends, you know, the word close, by the way, means indispensable. His indispensable friends, people that he has very, he's very close to, he invited them to come, and the place was filled because Cornelius invited them. Our church, this church, Fenwick Island campus, by the time we get to October or November, could be completely full. We'd have to be adding chairs if we simply did this one thing. 
We invited the people we have influence over. Invite people that, that, that we have influence over. Now, that's important. Here's the thing I want you to know. Our mission field is not with strangers. Our mission field is people that we know. Cornelius didn't invite strangers. He didn't go door to door, knocking on doors, inviting people to come hear Peter. He didn't waste his time doing that. He talked to his cousins. He talked to his uncle. He talked to his aunt. He talked to the guy he worked with. He talked to the soldiers and the barrack. He talked to people he knew. Our mission field is people that we know, not the strangers. And I remember when I was a young teenager, uh, early, well, actually late, uh, late teenager and Karen and I, we loved Jesus. We went to my dad's church. We were in our youth group, and we were zealous for the Lord. So we went down one uh, alternate 13, down from my dad's church in Laurel, knocking on doors. Knocking on doors, uh, telling people about Jesus and inviting them to church. Now, I remember, what I remember is one door I knocked on, there was a really mean Chesapeake retriever that chased me back in the car. I remember that. That's my, my memory of that. But we're knocking on doors of people we don't know, and we're praying the whole time. You know what we're praying? We're praying they won't be home. That's what we're praying. <laughs> Cold calling is hard. We're not called to reach strangers. We're called to reach people we know. Now, you say, Pastor, is there any exceptions to that, that we... Uh, you know, is there any exceptions that we are to re reach strangers? Well, sure there is. God can tap you on the shoulder, have you share the Lord with somebody. Uh, you know, Acts chapter 8, we have Philip, he's preaching in Samaria, and the Lord calls him to go talk to this guy in a chariot. He didn't know the guy. I was down in Orlando a couple weeks ago, Karen and I had a conference, and, and I used Uber for the first time. How many have ever used Uber before? It was a great experience. It's just click that little thing, and those, they come get you and, you know, give you a little mint, and you drive around. And on the way back to the airport, there was this guy that picked us up, Andre, and he had moved here from, the, uh, from uh, El Salvador, no, from Portugal, and uh, he was trying to learn English. He'd gone through two years of immigration process, him and his wife, to get their family out of Portugal because all the violence there. And uh, so I'm riding in the front seat with Andre. Got three other people in the back seat that are hitching a ride on my dime, you know, to go back to the airport. And uh, one of my missionary friend, and Karen was back there, and this other lady was going back to Atlanta. And I got talking to Andre, and he's trying to learn English, and I found out he was a lawyer, and he's now here, and his wife was a dentist, and she's, they're trying to get established in this country, and they're worried about their kids and all that. And the Lord just tapped me on the shoulder, and I started telling Andre about Jesus. And uh, he just was so open to the Lord. He was raised Catholic. I had to tell him about the Lord, and it was just wonderful. And I said, Andre, can I pray for you? Getting close to the airport. And I, I, I said, Andre, I'm going to pray for you. I want you to keep your eyes open. I'm going to pray for you. And I prayed for him. That word over him is wonderful. And God gives you moments like that. But your ministry is to people that you know. People that you connect with. People that you, that you know. And you, you need to say, you know, hey, listen. And here's how you invite them. You don't say, would you come to church with me sometime? A general invitation never works. Say it with me. A general invitation never works. You need a specific invitation. Our pastor next week is, you know, preaching on the ten toes in the book of Revelation. We would love to come, have you come here. And, you know, maybe just invite him to a specific Sunday. Say, hey, next Sunday, you know, my husband and I, we're all going to church. And, and pastor's been really doing good. And we got these new songs that we're doing. The praise team is doing great. And would, you, would you meet us? And we'll, we know we're going to, we'd love for you to come and meet us next Sunday. And then meet them outside. Don't come in and, and let them try to find you. Wait for them out there, you know, and, and walk in with them. And you invite them to church and you sit down with them. Now, there's some, there's some of you here this morning. You can look around here and you can see somebody that's here that you invited. And, and I know in Fenwick Island, I know we've got some networkers there in Fenwick Island. I know some of you. I know, I know we've got some people there that they, you're in church because somebody at Fenwick Island invited you to come to church. So we want to we make sure that we are 
on mission. What is our, what's the building block? What's the fundamental building block of Bayshore? The fundamental building block is our church is a church that reaches out to other people, invites other people to church. Now, I have to ask myself the hard question. How, the question we must all ask ourselves, is there anybody here in this building this morning from our neighborhood? Because, you know, here's what we do. Here's, here's what, where we are. And I'm not, this is not critical of Femic Island, not critical of you. It's just where we, we evolve to. We pat ourselves on the back because we're coming to church. We're doing good. We're, coming, we're finally coming to church again. And that's good. But our mission is bigger. Our mission is, is you pray over your neighborhood. You pray over plantation lakes. You pray over the, the development you live in. When's the last time you rode up and down the streets of your neighborhood and you prayed over that neighborhood and asked the Lord to help you to reach people in that neighborhood? And I believe God has given us the anointing, this post-COVID era, anointing to reach people that need to be reached. The Bible says that Jesus, as he's calling his 12 disciples, and he calls this guy named Andrew. Now, Andrew, you know, a little quiet guy. You never hear anything about Andrew. Andrew is one of the disciples of Jesus, and, and he had a pretty famous brother by the name of Peter. And Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist before he became a disciple of Jesus. And one day he's there working with John the Baptist, helping baptize people and passing out towels. And, 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 and Jesus walked by and John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Andrew started following Jesus and he met Jesus. And it says in John, the first thing he did, the first thing he did, his first priority was he went and told Simon about Jesus and brought Simon to Jesus. And Simon was changed by Jesus. I believe that there are there are, you are an Andrew, I am an Andrew, and there are people that you are called to reach. As we come into this fall, as we come into September and October, I believe the Holy Spirit's preparing us as a people to reach people. We're going to be giving out little invitation cards. I think they'll be here this week. We've got yard signs that are coming. Put a yard sign in your, in your, in your front of your yard uh, and, you know, about Bayshore. But that's, that's one thing, but that's a very small thing. But those are little cards, you know, you're hanging out with somebody, your buddy, you're, ha- you're playing cards, you're playing, you know, uh, some games, card games, whatever. And you, hey, you just, the Lord taps you on the shoulder. Hey, how about if you and, you and Jane go to come to church with us next week? And you invite him to church. I just love it. I love it. I'm a, I got more stuff here. I'm real excited about this. There's more stuff, but I'm out of time. You know, have you got just, just two minutes? Give me two minutes. I'm not sure you just gave me two minutes, but I'm going to maybe take it anyhow. <laughs> oh, 2 Kings 7. When I was a young preacher, I always preached on this text. 2 Kings 7. There's this, uh, there's this, this the capital of, of Israel, northern kingdom, is Samaria. The Syrians have surrounded the city. There's a famine in the city because of the siege. And everybody's starving to death. There's cannibalism in the city. It's awful. And there's four lepers hanging out at the city gates. And the four lepers, they say, man, we're in bad trouble. We got leprosy. And if we go in the city, there's no food in there. There's no hope for us there. If we stay here, we're going to die. And the four lepers say to themselves, well, why don't we go to the Syrian camp? And maybe they'll have mercy on us and they'll give us some food. That's their only chance. So... They're standing there, and they wait till dusk. And I don't know why they waited till dusk, but it may be that they wanted to wait till it got dark. So when they came into the camp, the Syrians wouldn't recognize that they were leprous. But at dusk, they started walking, and the Lord amplified their steps somehow. So the Syrian army thought that there were armies that had been hired by Israel that were coming to take them down. And so the Syrians flee, and they leave their tent, they leave their camp, they leave all their food there. And these four starving lepers go into the go into the uh, tents and they started eating food they got whipped cream they're putting on the uh, strawberry shortcake they're they're eating prime rib and and then they take their silver and their gold and they're hiding it and and they're and, and they're just having a wonderful time and then they say to themselves we're not doing right this is a day of good news 
This is a day of good news, and the Lord's surely going to judge us if we don't go and tell the people in the city that there's food outside the city. And so they go, to the camp, they go back to the city gates and they cry, There's food out here! There's food! The Syrians are gone! And the, they did a little check thing to make sure it was really true. And the people in the city... The people in the city flood out of those gates and they go and they begin to take the bread. Here's what D.L. Moody said. Some people say D.L. Moody. Some people say Martin Luther. I don't know who said it, but somebody said it. He said, Christianity is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Christianity is where one beggar tells another beggar where to find bread. Let me ask you this morning, Bay Shore, Femic Island. Let me ask you, Millsboro here. Uh, let me ask you, how many have found some bread in Jesus, the bread of life? How many have found some bread in Jesus? And how many know we need to tell others that there's bread outside? There's bread outside. You don't have to stay in your lonely, depressed life just watching Netflix over and over again. You're bored out of your mind. You need to find the living bread, Jesus, who can change your life. Amen. Would you lift your hands to the Lord and ask the Lord to help you be an instrument? Father God, we thank you for this mission that you've given Bayshore. That this is a Holy Ghost mission. It's not the mission of some ambitious preacher that wants to fill a few chairs. It's a mission of the Holy Spirit upon our church. Wake us out of our lethargy. Wake us up, Lord. Help us to begin to bring our friends and bring our loved ones and fill our cars and fill our trucks and fill our vans with people that need you. We thank you that this fall the Holy Spirit is moving. It's beginning this summer, preparing us for a great move of your spirit this fall. We thank you for your love and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And amen.